Welcome to the Toffee Blues, your source for all things Everton, and welcome to an exclusive Toffee Blues interview with it today. It's an absolute pleasure for me to be joined by former Everton and Canada international striker Thomas Radzinski. Hey, thank you so sorry. much. I'm great, thank you, Thomas. It's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on, and a very warm welcome to the Toffee Blues. How are you? You're staying home at the moment, staying safe. Well, you know, like like everybody, I guess. I mean, I I hope, anyways. I'm uh, I'm trying to restrict my movements to uh, to the garden and and you know to the uh, grocery shops, and uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, uh, it's it's a terrible thing that's happening right now all over the world. I mean, I even had to cut my um, honeymoon short um, from uh, well from New Zealand and Pacific Islands. Uh, me and my uh, me and my wife we are kind of 18 years together and uh, and after having kids we um, we decided to go on a honeymoon and we had to cut it short uh, just after one day I mean we basically arrived in New Zealand and they told us nothing is going to go through so um, we flew nice. back with a very that's nice such, uh, such a shame. Oh, it is it is a shame but that means you know we're serious about it as well we want we want everything to stop as soon as possible and uh, and this is the reason why we decided to go home and actually stay home, stay safe, and then hopefully everybody's doing the same uh, same thing a little bit. Um, every little bit helps uh, to keep it contained, and hopefully it's going to be over soon, because I'm guessing uh, you old toughies are wanting to go to the stadium again and watch football. <laughs> Definitely. And, and the longer we stay at home, I'm guessing the quicker it's going to be uh, contained and the quicker we can go and enjoy football again. That's it. I think everybody's got to do the bit. Um, it's great to hear that you're staying, stay, staying safe, your family staying safe, and the same goes for me at my end as well, mate. So, fair play to you, of course. Moving on to the show, Thomas is a player I have very fond memories of watching in the very early stages of my time supporting Everton. He had a three-year spell, 2001 to 2004, 101 appearances and 26 goals for the Blues. But firstly, we're going to go right back to the beginning of your career. You started professionally in Europe, in Belgium, with Ekeren in 1994. You, already, you grew up in Poland, Germany and Canada before those 11 years, separately in Belgium, four with Ekeren, three with Anderlecht and four towards the end of your career with Lies. So clearly you settled very well in Belgium, as we can see right now, you live there, don't you? Well, I settled pretty much anywhere very well. I mean, uh, even in Liverpool, I settled uh, pretty well just because Probably I've been moving uh, since my very young years from one country to another, from one uh, culture to another. So uh, it was quite difficult in the first two to three months, I'm not going to lie to you, to actually understand the uh, Liverpool accent. But, uh, <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not surprised. Yeah, but, but you know, um, after uh, listening to Duncan Ferguson afterwards speaking his uh, dialect, it was, it was quite easy. So. <laughs> oh yeah, Duncan Ferguson is a Scottish accent. Yeah, yeah, but one of one of the more difficult ones, if I have to say. But yeah, right now, you know, I started my career, my my football career in in Belgium in Ecker, and, and I live actually only fifteen, uh, well, ten minutes away from Ecker right now. So it's one of those um, uh, one of those countries where it's actually stuck to my heart. My wife is from here. My kids were born here. I have three daughters right now, eleven, eight, and six year old. So they are still fairly young, but uh, they're all born in Belgium. So. I think it's going to be uh, another few years uh, staying here uh, in the in, in region of Antwerp. And I don't see any reason why you should move. It's a lovely place to live as well, I'd imagine. Well, the girls, uh, the ladies, they love it because we have the best chocolate. And the lads love it too, actually, because <laughs> we have more than 400 uh, sorts of beer. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there's going to be enough uh, connoisseurs that, uh, that would like to come in Belgium and live here. Oh, certainly. And no wonder you settle so well. Well, no, I'm more a wine drinker and I don't need chocolate, so... Oh, well, well, at least the girls are happy. Yeah, definitely they are, yeah. So let's not forget that shortly before joining Everton, you impressed greatly for in Europe with Anderlecht. You scored twice to beat Man United as well as scoring against Lazio later on in that tournament. So some very impressive showings in Europe and in the Belgian league for you, enough to convince Everton to make an offer for you. You signed for Everton from Anderlecht in July 2001 for four and a half million. So we'll start from there. How did the move to Everton come about? Well, it was it was this um, very good uh, Champions League uh, show from my side in in, in that season, and uh, it's um, uh, there was lots of interest from from Spanish uh, from Spanish clubs actually, but. Uh, 
I was not really keen into uh, into really moving into the Spanish competition. I uh, I thought the Premier League was something that uh, would suit my uh, my style of play a little bit better. I mean, I was not the most skillful player out there, but um, I was very rapid, very uh, very quick off the mark, and I thought the Premier League would be uh, would be just a perfect. Um, uh, just a perfect competition for me. So um, after getting a, a, a phone call via via um, from uh, from Walter Smith, he was the, um, uh, the the coach, the gaffer at that time at Everton. You know, it went went quite fast from 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 there. Um, I, I wanted to leave Anderlecht at that time, and, and Everton showed lots of interest and. Uh, and after also speaking to uh, to uh, Alan Ball during the summer, um, we were doing some commercial for, I believe, the PlayStation or whatever it was. He was telling me that uh, that um, Everton is probably the best uh, club in in all of uh, the UK uh, when it comes to the fans. And uh, he told me, you don't have to be the best player out there you don't have to be the most skillful but as long as you're going to give 110 percent every single game they're going to love you and this is something that uh, actually uh, gave me a push as well to uh, to consider Everton and, and actually sign and choose Everton at the end of it so uh, many many little things uh, contributed to me me signing to Everton and I have not had any regrets since. Fantastic uh, just on the notes of when you signed in 2001 which other clubs were interested? Which Spanish clubs and anybody else? Well, the biggest, the biggest one was Valencia at that time, and and they were quite big uh, in, in the year two thousand. So, uh, um, I I don't I don't know exactly. I mean, there's there's also lots of um, agent talks. Um, Valencia, I know, is a very very solid one, but the rest, you know, agents talk, and uh, they try to make your head a little bit crazy, so you make a decision. Uh, based on maybe some fiction and more than facts. So, uh, well, I just know Valencia was there and there's a few other clubs that uh, probably was more of an imagination of the agent rather than than the actual facts. So I rather don't mention them because... I, 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 I think we can get have a little guess anyway. Yeah, but, uh, it, would be, it would be too high for, for my level, I'm guessing. Anyways. I have a funny feeling what you're going to say. But, yeah. uh, of course, I remember you saying in a program, an official Everton program, quite recently that you didn't actually have an agent of your own, did you? No, I, d- I did not. Actually, the the move came through through the clubs, and uh, and only um, only the, the underlet they have put an agent uh, in place to actually do the deal because apparently um, it was it was necessary to have an agent to make a move, um, which I didn't know at the time. But uh, you know. Um, I was just glad that um, I uh, I could go to the Premier League and uh, and I could perform every week, uh, week in week out in in, in massive stadiums, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a fans that are sitting right next to the the, the pitch. It was just an unbe- unbelievable experience for me, and and it was kind of playing the Champions League every single week rather than you know waiting for it to come uh, at the end of the season. Hopefully. After winning the league, you know, or qualifying for it, so it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite nice. Of course, when you first joined the season before, we were in a relegation fight. What did Walter Smith tell you about the club before joining, or when you joined, and what was expected? Well, <clears throat> the expectations, as usual, you know, you come as a striker, so they expect you to score goals to actually get uh, as early as possible out of the rele- relegation fight, and and then you know the the compactness of the of the Premier League uh, makes it so wonderful that uh, you know if you win two three times in a row, you actually um, uh, fighting for the European places and Champions League places, since there are so many Premier League teams who have been always uh, qualifying for the European leagues. So, um, and then you lose three games in a row and you actually uh, get stuck in the back of the table and, and you're fighting for relegation. So, it's, uh, you know, the task was simple. Come, yeah. uh, make an impression and start scoring goals. <laughs> and unfortunately, yeah. somewhere around November, I got, uh, I got injured and I did not recover until uh, it was too late where, um, where Walter Smith has been sacked at that time and, and David Moyes arrived. And I believe that was beginning of February um, of 2002. <clears throat> Pretty close. I think it was the March because, of course, oh. he did come back in February. You scored against Liverpool actually just before he got sacked, so you didn't do too badly. Yeah, that was uh, the wonderful goals ever. I think I touched my knee, my shin, and my big toe to go in. So <laughs> it wasn't beautiful, but it was important. 
I'm sure the fans didn't complain. No, I didn't complain either. Of course, you scored before all that. You scored on your full debut against West Ham. And at that point, we were up the top end of the table. And you scored in a 5-0 win. Kevin Campbell scored as well. How did it feel scoring that first goal for Everton? And did you have a good relationship with Kevin Campbell? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I'm, we were we were quite quite close with Kevin, um, with uh, with Thomas Gravison and and Alessandro Pistoni. So um, that was uh, that was from my point of view, obviously. And uh, me living in in Liverpool itself, in uh, Sef, Sefton Park, it was. Um, that's where I uh, I lived. And all the boys uh, they actually moved away from Liverpool, and I I believe they were living in the area close to Manchester. So uh, from time to time, I did travel um, up. up to Manchester just to visit them. Sometimes we went uh, into uh, the Trafford Centre, um, do some shopping, um, and just just you know have a different uh, have a different view of life and and something more relaxed uh, at Manchester. But yeah, Kevin Kevin was a very good uh, very good friend, not only on the pitch but off the pitch as well. And I have fond memories of him. And uh, uh, well, he being the captain as well for the Toffees at that time made it made it extra special. Of course, it's always good to get on well with the club captain. And we mentioned some strong characters there. And I heard you on an older podcast called Team 33, and you said that you were very close with Tommy Gravison, weren't you? Yeah, well, he was he was one of the very few guys who lived in uh, in, uh, in Liverpool. Um, and actually, he lived in the centres in Bitan Plaza. So it was quite easy to, to hook up with Tommy. Um, because we would go for for lunch together. We would, and we would go to his place, play some billiards and... Uh, and yeah, it would be. Uh, we were we were quite close until the moment he moved to 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 Real Madrid. We uh, we kept in contact quite a lot, so uh, it was fun. Since then, uh, all 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 but lost with Tommy. I I really have no idea where he is right now. I've been following his career since a little bit, but uh, I have no idea what he's doing right now. Whether or not he's still alive, also, it's kind I'm of. Pre- I'm pretty sure he, he became a professional poker player or something. He went to Las really? Vegas. And I'm sure he did. Yeah, I'll have to check on that. But I'm sure that's what he did. Well, then, uh, good luck to him. I mean, you need you need luck with poker. I'm guessing. Definitely needs luck. But I'm pretty sure he's done pretty well. He's a. Uh, um, he might have gone pro. I'm not too sure. All right. Well. Excellent. <laughs> Might have to visit him in Vegas. <laughs> Definitely. He's, like you say, he's one of the most interesting characters in that squad while you were there. But there was a few others as well. Duncan Ferguson, Gaza, Abel Xavier. Is there any other funny or mad stories that you could bring us from any of those guys? Well, Gaza, Gaza with... Uh, with uh... With Xavier, with with Abel, it was fantastic because they were my neighbors. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I just, I just, I'm not sure people want to listen to those, or maybe I'm, I'm actually not sure I can disclose any of those. To be honest, I mean, with all the respect to Gaza and to Abel, it's, uh, I rather keep it, I rather keep it private. Uh, it's, it's, it's more, it's more within the football world rather than <laughs> going to the toffees because they might they might think completely different of them after that. Well, I tell you one one funny story about Gaza when 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 he was actually uh, going fishing in the morning and he would come back with a fish and he would put it into the the trunk of one of the uh, of the uh, mas- massage people. <laughs> I think it was oh Jimmy. Oh my god! Yeah, and the car started to smell and smelled even worse and smelled even worse, but they couldn't find the uh, the. Uh, the origin of the uh, of the smell. So, I uh, I am not quite sure, but I think he had to sell his car uh, just because oh, yeah. the car was smelling and they couldn't find it. And Gaza didn't tell him nothing for two weeks, so he only told him when it was too late. <laughs> he sold the car and then he told him. Yeah, yeah, it was it was hiding under the spare tire, so obviously nobody would look over there for the source of of that smell in a car. But uh, it was funny. I thought it was funny at that time. I mean, I, I'm sure not everybody thought it was funny, but. Uh, for me, it was. It must have been great being part of that squad. Of course, it was quite a, quite a strong character filled squad. Really, it was. They had the likes of David Unsworth, David Weir, like big Sun. So, was... Alan Studs was there as well, and he was also one one tough character. You know, we had we. I think we had a very good group. I mean, uh, we uh, we used to come uh, quite early in the morning for the training sessions because we had a ping pong table set up in in a warming up um, gym. And we would have um, battles of ping pong, and and believe it or not, Gaza was probably the best ping pong player you ever encounter. He would be standing there and just killing it all, 
I mean, uh, we, we know we know how great Gaza was uh, and how technical he was and how great uh, ball uh, fanatic he was. So, uh, he, he, yeah, I, I really couldn't believe it that somebody who slept, uh, let's say, five hours a day, that he could still manage to see that tiny little ball flying with that speed and, and, and beat everybody else around the table, which was, uh, yeah, it was really, really fun to see. Yeah, that's, a, that's a very interesting story, actually. I'd, ne- I'd never imagined Gaza was that good at ping pong. Well, he, he was phenomenal. He was not good. He, I think I think if you practice a little bit more, he would have been like joined with the national team of uh, probably England. I don't know. I don't know the level, but it seemed like he was fantastic. So it's very interesting one. We do have one story to ask you about. Of course, we spoke with Alan Myers, who you might remember from your time at Everton, and he told us to say a warm hello to you. By the way. And also ask you about your first morning at the Choco training camp in Italy where they asked you to go swimming and you refused until Archie Knox changed your mind. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that, if you can remember, of course? Well, I I, I do remember because, um, well, <laughs> I, I came from a kind of a different mentality. Um, football at Anderlecht, you know, we, um, we, we kind of um, could do pretty much... Um, what we wanted during the uh, course of the week, as long as we were ready at the uh, at the end of the weekend, and and you know just play and win. That was that was pretty much what we uh, needed to do. I just remember I signed um, I signed for Everton. I had to fly out to Italy to the to the training camp, and and I arrived quite late. I mean it was it was almost dark, so. Um, I think the only the only uh, moment I saw everybody uh, was uh, when they were leaving the dinner table. Um, so for me, it was was quite a late night, and then early morning um, we got woken up at uh, I'm not sure anymore, but it was <laughs> it was just barely light. So it was cold outside, and there was a swimming pool, and the swimming pool was not heated. And again, I was not used to that. So uh, so then. Uh, Archie was uh, was telling everybody, "Okay, guys, uh, for you uh, morning wake up call, you're jumping in, doing a few runs, and 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 you uh, you're ready to go for your run, for your jog." I was like, I put my uh, big toe in the water, and it was too cold, and I said, "Nah, <laughs> that's 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 not for me." But uh, it's just because obviously I was still on my underlegged uh, my underlegged time and my underlegged. Uh, um, uh, routine rather than knowing what Archie Knox is like. <laughs> and what is he like? Obviously, a half an hour. No, maybe not a half an hour. Fifteen minutes later, he did change my mind. I did. I did jump in. I, I froze my <clears throat> bollocks off, and uh, and well, I had to do it every day since. Uh, <laughs> it was really the funnest memory of my first training at Everton, but it's a memorable one, which uh, which well, you know, twenty years later, I still remember, <laughs> which uh, counts for something. Sorry? It was a pretty vivid memory. You remember it very well. Yeah, I do remember it very well because uh, obviously I was like, what the heck is this guy doing saying no to Archie Knox? And I was like, I didn't know who that was at that time. So I was thinking, okay, I uh, I take my chances. So it didn't take, take long to change it though. You, you need to do whatever the coach is asking. So, uh, you know, thinking about it afterwards, it made, it made sense. I mean, everybody's going in. What makes you so special? You're not going to go in and it's your new club. So uh, just go with the program and, and, and just, uh, you know, do your bit. And don't, be, uh, don't do stupid things. The guys are going to look at you differently if you start doing stupid things from the very first day. So, so you got involved. But, of course, towards the end of that season, Walter Schmidt was sacked and we'd only won once in 13 league games. Of course, you say you were injured for a large period of that. We were just one point above relegation. And David Moyes came in and steered us clear. How did you feel after Walter was sacked with Moyes coming in? Of course, Walter was the man who signed you, but what yeah. difference was there between Walter and David? It is it, it is long time now. It's, um, and to be perfectly honest, the first uh, few months at Everton were... Where you know it's it's an adjustment period. You're coming from the Belgium league. It doesn't matter which league you're playing. You're going to the Premier League, and you you need a few months to adjust to not only the speed and the tempo of the game, but also the mentality, how you approach the game, what you have to um, what you have to do, the tactical part, the technical part. You 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 really it it really takes um, a lot out of you uh, if you're not born. 
in the uh, in in the UK. You know, it's uh, it's it's completely different to to what we know, to what I've known from from Canada, from Belgium. So uh, by the time you actually get into the the uh, you know the, the the line of training and 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 the way you 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 have to play and you have to train. Well, the time of Walter Smith was over, so um, it, it was quite it was quite short for me. For me, it was still a huge learning uh, learning process during that time. And then when David Moyes came, I do remember that it was uh, coming straight from my injury almost too, and then the uh, the intensity at the training was uh, slightly different, and uh, and we were doing way more work uh, tactically um, as well. So uh, you know, the trainings were finished and. Uh, and we would have to stay on the pitch for another half an hour, sometimes to an hour, to actually do you uh, do your tactics, uh, set pieces, um, where to run, at what time. So in that aspect, I think we were we were better prepared for the Premier League with um, with uh, David Moyes because uh, everybody actually knew perfectly um, uh, his position at any given moment. Um, rather than maybe uh, only certain situations with Walter Smith, but. Again, um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to say that uh, Walter had bad trainings or in, in any way. It's just uh, maybe the information that was coming to me at that time was just too much to handle for me, um, and uh, I do not remember every single training session at that time. And when David Moyes came, maybe I was already uh, adjusting to the Premier League live, and and it was kind of uh, getting easier to. Uh, you know, to to uh, to perform on a pitch, and then you take in more care of your trainings as well. Well, we'll move on to your adjustments. You clearly were adjusting very well because the second season was David's first full season, and it was a much more successful season where we finished seventh. Moyes was doing a decent job at this stage, and you scored eleven goals this season and was our top scorer in the league. I've got a few moments for us to look back on from that year where you clearly made your mark. First of all. The Arsenal game, your goal sadly gets forgotten about a little bit because of the one Wayne Rooney scored. But yours was also a very good goal and it helped us go on and beat an Arsenal team who were unbeaten until that point that season and of course went the next season completely unbeaten. So a very enjoyable day for us and you certainly played your part. Do you remember that game well? I don't remember that game well. I do... <laughs> Like you said, I do remember Wayne's goal. I do remember my goal, of course, uh, as well. But uh, you know, everything has been overshadowed by by Wayne's goal. I mean, he's 16. Uh, Seaman has his long ponytail. He wants to cut off right after that game, you know. Uh, but his goal, uh, Wayne's goal, was amazing. Mine was a little bit lucky. Um, it's just because it went through a wall of players. I have no idea how it went through. Uh, because uh, I, uh, I I shot from just outside the penalty box, I believe, and and there's like uh, I'm guessing eight to ten bodies <laughs> in a way, and and it's just like everybody starts to walk away, and and it uh, just hits the middle of the net. So it was very strange that it went in, but it did go in, and uh, it was I think at that moment it was one one. Then uh, then I got swapped. Wayne came in the last uh, 15 minutes, I believe, and then he makes this magic goal from way outside the box, uh, which was uh, for me a goal of the season at that time anyways. So uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, anytime you, you, you beat the top team in, in the Premier League uh, and Arsenal was at that time the top of the, uh, of the bunch, um, you know, it's, it's a memorable time and, and Arsenal was a good team for me to play against. I, uh, I scored quite a few goals against Arsenal, so I, I will not forget those goals quite easy. So, <laughs> this one, this one is, was not the nicest, but uh, it counted uh, nevertheless. I actually thought it was quite a good goal. You took a bouncing ball and then smashed it in, if I remember rightly. I really enjoy watching that one, back to be honest. Oh, cool, thank you. Uh, of course, we've got to mention Wayne. What was it like playing alongside him, training alongside him? Obviously, he had bags of talent at a very young age, didn't he? Yeah, it was very strange. I mean, the first time, the first time he came to the training sessions, I had no idea that Wayne was only sixteen. I mean, he looked so much more mature. I'm not going to say older because that would be an insult, but uh, he looked mature for his age. Um, and definitely, when you saw him uh, with the ball and what he was doing in training, it was um, it was amazing. It was well. Was impressive uh, to say the least. Uh, just because he was only 16, um, and the skills were on the level of somebody who was well playing the game already for the last 10 years uh, on the highest level. So it was uh, 
it was fun to watch. It was really, really fun to watch. And uh, and I um, I will not be lying if I tell you that he uh, his skills at training were out um, outperforming whatever it was he was showing on the pitch for the first six months for Everton, because um, the trainings I think he was more relaxed and he would dare to do more things at training. And then when he came to the games, I'm guessing the time um, and maybe also the idea of having a full stadium behind him uh, or against him at that time, you know, would be maybe too much for a young 16 year old. But uh, the training sessions were amazing. He was uh, later on in his career, he was showing whatever he was showing at training at that time. He was obviously executing it at the, at the football pitch on the pitch. But uh, the first six months of training were, were unbelievable. You're thinking, oh, my God. <laughs> How? How do you even think about what she's doing? And and yeah, well, later on, uh, you know, he showed everybody uh, that he could do it uh, uh, on the pitch as well. So um, yeah, it was amazing to watch, and uh, and I was really uh, happy to see him grow to uh, to this international famous player. And I was very fortunate to uh, to see his beginning of his career and then play alongside him uh, uh, during a few games as well. Yeah, it was, I think it was, for us it was a great time to see him come through and uh, of course at the same time see you scored a lot of crucial goals. It was a pretty decent team we had that season and I've got a bit of a random question about that season. Okay. Two, players, two players that are remembered just by the weird reason that they signed. Do you remember much about Lee Tier or Lee Wei Feng from your time at the club? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, <laughs> now, I don't know if it was a rumor or not, but uh, not Li Tie, but the other Li Wei Teng. Uh, he, uh, I, I heard he was playing for the national team for uh, Chinese ping pong. Decent player, you know. I, I, I don't think he was. Uh, I don't think he was bad at all. And knowing the big following of uh, of uh, out of China, I think it was a very um, smart move for the commercial reason for Everton. Having 10 million followers just for one player, uh, I think put Everton also on a map in, in the Chinese market. And, and I believe that uh, Bill Kenwright was thinking also about making Everton a, a bigger, better team. And the only way to do that is to generate some, uh, some funds and some money. Um, and the way to do that was the Chinese market at that time. So... Um, as strange as it might sound, uh, Li Tai was not the worst player in the world. He was he was quite decent. He was very very technical, and I think he played quite a few games for us. And I believe he also gave a few assists for me. Uh, so for he did. Me, was, yeah, so for me for me he was uh, he was a good player. And from from a commercial point of view, I think it was not the bad signing. So um, you know, strange as it may seem, I, I, I think it was a good sign for Everton. I think Lee Tia certainly was. I thought, I do remember seeing him put on some pretty decent displays that season, and of course, I think linked up well with the likes of you and Kev in front of him. But I don't, I don't recall a lot seeing a lot of Lee Wei Feng playing, which was, of course, they were both internationals. I saw them play at the World Cup the year before with China, but not, not a lot with Everton. So it, it was quite an interesting one. I think it was one that the, the fans were very interested to get to know a bit more about those guys, and obviously, we didn't really well, see too much of them. Well, you, you, you can't forget that the Premier League is a very tough competition and, and you do sign um, anywhere between 25 and 35 players. Now, um, he was a defender as well and to get a place in a defence um, in the Premier League is, is not that simple. You, you, you need some experience and the only way to get the experience is if you actually uh, head and shoulders above the players who have been already in the heart of the defence uh, for Everton and... I think David Weir was at that time, and he had uh, he had bags of experience, and and Alan Stubbs were there as well. So if you have to replace those players, well, then you must be really exceptional. And if you're not exceptional, then you might never get your chance. So you can also put only 16 players on the bench. Now, looking looking at the squad that we had at that time, I mean, I would not have picked him uh, above any of those two players that we had in the center of the central defense. So. Um, yeah, it's 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 a tough one. You you get your chance, you have to take it. But if you don't get your chance, well, um, then you might never really get it. So uh, again, anywhere between twenty five and thirty five players, and that was the time of the year two thousand uh, to two thousand and five. I believe some clubs right now they have more than forty players. So mm -hmm. um, uh, you, it's not going to be um, it's not going to be uh, unusual to sign players and and actually never see them on the pitch. Uh, it's just. Uh, 
the coaches they have to make a choice and and uh, only the strongest survive is one of those uh, yeah one of those unfortunate um, well I don't know if it's unfortunate actually it's a it's it's a good deal because the best players go on a pitch according to the gaffer and he makes the selection so you're better you're gonna play if you're not better do something that's gonna make you special and make uh, make the gaffer put you in a team simple as that. That's it, yeah. And of course, on that note with those two players, we, we talked there was a game on New Year's Day, I think it was, two thousand and three, and it was one of it was the most watched game at the time in China as we took on Manchester City. Lee Tia played for us and Sun Ji Hai played for Man City. Uh we were losing two one and you scored in the last minute to make it two all. So Yeah, I'm never gonna forget that because I it's it's the first time I had to spend New Year's in the hotel room. You know, it was um <laughs> I mean, as nice as it is for the fans and as beautiful as it is for everybody else, I mean, it's a pain in the ass to sit in your hotel room, tic-tac, tic-tac, okay, happy new year to myself. You know, um, face FaceTime you, WhatsApps and your Skypes and whatever. I, I, I don't think it existed back then. No, yet. no. Or maybe just. So, um, well, the only thing you could do is just Call somebody to wish him a happy new year. It was it, it was a little bit surreal, uh, you know, eating your your lunch at eight a.m. So you're waking up instead of having breakfast, you're having your pasta with your chicken and and getting ready for a noon kickoff at Man City. And 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 yeah, I do remember that goal. Schmeichel was in goal, and there was a there was a very very <laughs> I don't know if it's a beautiful ball or how can you describe it from from Steve Watson, I think. It was Steve Wilson. Yeah. Very long ball, and and I think uh, Schmeichel came to just wrap it up, and me with my speed, I check, I think I just nicked it with my left hair somewhere from around here, and then and then steered it away just above his shoulder, and two two last minutes. It was uh, that was that was the only that was the only way I saved my New Year, you know, by scoring that goal and by actually you know getting a point at Man City. If we would have lost there, then it would have been a waste of <laughs> waste of time to go to a hotel and not celebrate the new year. But this make it all uh, made it all good, uh, good and well. And the year started with uh, on a good note again. It certainly did, and obviously we move on to the next one. The next game I was going to bring up was the game in February, the Southampton game. What a mad game that was! Your goals were crucial at the time. We were pu- pushing for Europe. What do you remember of that game and the goals? Well, what I remember of that game is that we, well, I think we should have scored about 15, well, not 15, but let's say we should have scored at least 10 goals that game. Definitely. And we haven't. And then Southampton, they came probably one time close in, uh, closer to our goal and, 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 and they scored. And then it's quite difficult, you know, to, to make it. Um, I rarely score a goal with the head, but I think it was a, it was a cross from Wayne Rooney who um, yeah. to set up the 1-1. Um, then uh, that second one. the second one was was amazing but if i remember correctly i had the exact same thing uh hitting the post yeah. a few minutes before so so it wasn't a fluke eh? i was really aiming for that corner you definitely were <laughs> yeah, and yeah but the second one was the second one was amazing i years later i was speaking about it with because antinieni was a, was a was a keeper at uh, at fulham years later and uh so we we did men, we we did talk about it. and He says, "What the hell?" He's like, "You know, if you're gonna try it ten more times, you're never gonna score that goal." And I say, "Come on!" I aim for the post the first time, just you know, to put the marker on, and the second time, I just wanted to put in the corner, and made it look nice. So and then we had a we had a big laugh. But uh, yeah, it was it was a really nice goal, and uh, and obviously the emotions after that goal were 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 yeah were high. I went I went a little bit mental. I usually don't celebrate a goal like this, but uh, <laughs> this time. Uh, I uh, I give it a full wow the lion's roar. Well, it, it's funny you should say that because this was actually the first ever Everton game I watched live, and of course the oh. very late winning goal, the celebrations. From then on, I've always been a mad fan of Everton. So for me personally, Thomas, I owe you a lot for what you did that day. Well, excellent. Uh, I could make another fan, another toughie on that day. Well, that's it. Yeah, I was a, I was very young. I think it was six, maybe seven at the time. So I've a lot of fond memories of looking back. That was the first game I watched live, and it was um, obviously it was all. I've never really looked back since then. So thank you so much. Cool. You're welcome. 
Thank you. And um, of course, there was a lot of competition up front at the time for Everton with the likes of Dunk, Kevin Campbell, Chadwick, Wayne Rooney, and Brian McBride as well for a spell. How did you find that kind of big competition up front? Well, to be honest, if uh, the more competition you have, it's it's usually the better for the striker. It's just because it keeps you on your toes. Um, I, I think I think the minimum of uh, of strikers you should have in a team is four. I think the maximum should be six, um, just because you don't want to oversaturate uh, that area. You 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 should do scouting um, uh, first, and then just make sure you have different type of strikers. And I believe with uh, with the six names that you just mentioned, we had the variety. You know, we had the length, we had the power, we had the speed, we had the combination of them of them both, uh, of of all of it as well. And we had uh, we have we had Captain America, who was the most professional <laughs> professional guy that I probably ever encountered in football. I mean, he would be working uh, not only on the pitch but off the pitch uh, twice as hard as anybody else, which which was very very nice to see and. At that time, obviously, uh, it would be something very special because um, not 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 everybody would do the extras that uh, the extra mile that Brian McBride did. So it was um, yeah, it was 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 very interesting to to actually see the different characters and different ways of approaching the the training sessions and 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 how they can perform later on uh, based on whatever they have done in the training during the week. So um, you know. The most strikers usually uh, uh, translates into um, more competition, which should translate into uh, more goals. Um, and uh, I think that was uh, that was a bonus um, for us at that time. Yeah, it was a very short spell for Brian at Everton, but he was he certainly <clears throat> remembered very well at, by our fans, and I think he he paired up really well with you. And of course, he's paired up again at Fulham later on as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was um, like I said, I've I've, I've never seen anybody working uh, as hard on and off the pitch as Brian McBride, uh, which uh, which made me rethink the way I was training as well. Obviously, with the experience, that the, the, the older you get, the the better you take care of your body. The more you start working on and off the pitch with uh, certain things, uh, just to make sure that you you stay injury free. And uh, and strangely, the 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 older I got, the less injured I became. Um, it's probably down due to uh, the way of training uh, for myself as well later on in my career. Um, I wish uh, I wish I maybe met Brian a little bit earlier in my uh, in in my career. Maybe I would have had uh, less injuries. But then again, um, having the, uh, the the fibers in my muscles the way I used to have, you know, the, the, the sprinters. Um, uh, muscles was quite difficult to keep me away from little injuries. It's just because I was so explosive that um, that you know I was more of a sprinter kind than 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 a football uh, kind, which ma- which which made my, my my muscles a little bit more stiffen up. So uh, any little tweak uh, or any little discomfort, I should normally uh, stop with training and stop with the game. But obviously in football it's not that easy. Um, you you have 90 minutes on a pitch. You have to you have to prepare. So um, uh, you know I, I I did work later on in my career on on, on becoming a little bit less uh, injury prone and and made it uh, uh, made it through a few seasons without any kind of injuries, which was nice to see. But at the time when you were young and and you still um, you know in in, in you in your prime. Then it's quite difficult to uh, to hold yourself back and not wanting to play. Sometimes you know, if um, sometimes it would be at the time where you know the, the coach David Moyes would come and would say, oh, "How are you feeling?" Even though you felt not a hundred percent, but you want to play so badly that you would tell him, "Yeah, everything is perfect." Um, it's a little bit selfish in a way because there is other strikers who could maybe do the job um, a little bit better than you because they were 100 percent and not injured. But you, uh, you just you just want to do the job for the team, and especially when you when you're sitting on top of the of the league and you just want to push yourself because well, like you said, 11 goals. Um, what a that second battle, season. Yeah. Yeah, 11, 11 goals that second season and then through stupidity at training, you know, I get injured again and I miss the last seven or eight or ten games end of the season. And and it's, it's just because you want, you, you think you're invincible, you have 11 goals and you're thinking about, you know, 
maybe 15, maybe getting close to 20 this season, uh, which would be fantastic for, for myself and for the club and then definitely send us into Europe that year. And then, you know, one, one stupid movement in training and then you're out for the season and, and it's just stuff like this would not happen when, when, when I was, let's say, 30, 30 plus because you learn, to, uh, you learn your body, uh, the way it responds to different things and I wouldn't let it get injured rather than, you know, it's going to be okay. So, a few mistakes you make over the years that I would have made if I knew a little bit better and then, and that'd be maybe a little bit more professional. But uh, this this is the experience. It comes with the experience and uh, and uh, and it's just too bad the experience is not right away at the age of 18, 19 where you can take it through your career because that would be phenomenal. But unfortunately, it's not. So you learn you learn every day. Certainly, and of course, it was a real shame to lose you to injury towards the end of that season. We dropped out of the European places, and despite that, it was still a much better season than the previous. But moving on to the final season, it was pretty eventful, and obviously it was a very disappointing season for us. We finished very low in the table, and you still managed eight goals, by the way, which is pretty decent considering how poorly we were playing. But, of course, we have to move on to the end of that season when we had the contract dispute and you put in a transfer request. I remember you saying in Everton's official programme in 2018, you said you deeply regretted the way you went about the transfer request and that you'd have done things a bit differently if you'd have had the chance again. In that piece, you were actually quoted saying, I wanted to stay longer. The anger took over and without thinking about it and going back and trying to negotiate, this stupid thing came out and... I know a lot of our fans were very upset by the way you left, myself included. So it's an opportunity really to maybe set the story straight about what happened in 2004. What do you remember from it? It was about the contract, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, it, well, listen, it's, um, it was with David Moyes. It was, uh, again, I, I don't blame David. I, I mean, whatever, whatever it was, he has lots of on his plates and he has to look for, for the best possible team um, that he can build for the next seasons to come. And... Uh, in, in, in my case, we uh, yeah we ended we ended up not uh, playing uh, very well that season. But like you said, you know eight goals and, and here and there I became the player of the season for many of the uh, Everton fans uh, fan groups. Um, so I came to David Moyes with a question. You know one season left to go on my contract and I would uh, I would like to stay. I would like an extension and. What did happen is he would extend my contract for just one season and I'm thinking, well, if it's going to be only one season, I'm going to be in the same boat the next year. So I said, look, I don't want, uh, I don't want stupid, crazy, you know, I'm very happy with uh, what I have here at Everton. The only thing I need is two years to actually put my mind at ease and, and I can really focus on my, on my career further on and maybe, you know, uh, I would be then 32 uh, maybe even stay later on here at the club because you never know. You know, Premier League, uh, Premier League um, career doesn't last that long, especially for foreign players. You know, so at 32, I'm thinking, you know, if I can have uh, next year plus two extra, that's going to be three years of, uh, of of staying longer at Everton. Would have been a fantastic, uh, fantastic. And uh, well, no matter how you turned, um, it was only one coming on the table and and. Like I said, it's uh, it's the sun and the anger, the uh, the experience about getting about the business and this uh, time. You know, I was dealing with these matters myself. That uh, you know, the anger takes over, and then you say some things like, you know, uh, I think Wayne should go to a bigger club <laughs> or to a better club or whatever it was. It was it, it was silly. I mean, at the end of the day. United, which was the biggest club in the world at that time. Um, but maybe I should have said, maybe I should have just a uh, great time and, and it's time to move on um, and, and just put it down on a table differently rather than the way I did. Um, yeah, like you were 27, 28, 30, sometimes you make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes and that was one of the big mistakes in my career because I, I love my time there and I regret saying these things and uh, it's just uh, it's just too bad it happened. Uh, would have, I, would have, I would have done it differently right now, simple as that. Uh, but I can't take it away anymore. I mean, it's been said, so it's there on the table. Everybody will remember this. So uh, if I can take my hats off to and apologize to all the Toffee fans, I will. 
So sorry about that. Uh, I know it uh, maybe means nothing right now. It's 15 years later, but uh, yeah, I still look. I, I still have my I still have my shirt. You know, I love this. Class, uh, cl- class one, that one. Yeah, that I will, I well. will not give it. I will not give it away for any money because it's part of me. It's part of, of who I was, who I grew up with, and and I have not only this one. I even have the one with the one to one season as well. One to one. That's uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I have a yellow shirt. I have a black shirt with the black, black. I know it's not the uh, toffee blue, but I still love it. So I have all my Everton shirts from every single year, and I'm not gonna put a part of them. You know, my daughters need to know the heritage of the dad when they uh, when they grow a little bit older. Yeah, like um, yeah, like like I said, it's uh, it's it's. I had really fantastic years at Everton. So the way you know the the way everything ended, I wish um, I wish it would have happened uh, differently. You know, when you think about it, unfortunately, it doesn't matter what they do or people do make mistakes and say stupid things. It ended up like this for me. Uh, it was really too, uh, I really had too good of a time um, over there at Liverpool, in, in Liverpool uh, and uh, at Goodison Park to, to, to finish it like this. But like I say, people do make mistakes and that was one of the, one of the biggest ones uh, that I have made. So sorry about that. Uh, I know it's uh, not much now, 15 years later, but uh, you know, hopefully, um, hopefully, it's gonna clear stuff up. And and it really was not meant like this. I, I rather, you know, I, I rather would have left on on good terms and probably just uh, you know say the time has come for me to move on and 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 that's it. But uh, I guess the uh, being upset of not getting the second year um, uh, added on to my contract made. Uh, made my head a little crazy and all strikers need to be a little bit crazy to perform well on a pitch <laughs> uh, a little bit like the goalkeeper <laughs> well uh, you certainly performed well in that second season I think that's the season we always seem to remember you by which suggests that you have left a, a good legacy at Everton certainly that season like I, like I say it's it's given me one of the my first ever memories of Everton so I've, I've got a lot to oh, like I, I owe you a lot for that basically and of course, you did move on to Fulham for 1.7 million in July 2004. Earlier that month, you did suggest the reason for leaving was that you thought Everton were going to be in a relegation battle the next season. How did you feel seeing Everton finish in the top four the following year? Presumably, you were quite surprised because I know we were. I, again, I I don't think this is things that I actually uh, that I actually said. Um, uh, most of the interviews, when they are done and they are done on paper, you know, the, uh, there are some opinions of the of, of the pers of the uh, journalists that they just add a few things. And I would never say that Everton would be in uh, in a relegation battle because, uh, well, <laughs> I am not that kind of person who uh, who likes to put uh, more negativity. I leave. So I. I would I wouldn't do that, but again, people people are trying. Uh, whatever whatever is said in the papers, they they always add a few things. Uh, if it's not on tape, and this is something that I learned later on, that uh, I was uh, very serious um, uh, later on. My career. Um, I have uh, become so paranoid as well that I was uh, recording all my interviews just to uh, have a proof of what I did say or did not say because. Uh, um, I was quite careful with my words towards the end of my career, and I just wanted to make sure that they cannot take me on any um, on any words that I might have uh, said uh, or hinted towards. So uh, you know, lesson learned again, and uh, it's just too bad. <laughs> like I said, I wish the experience of all your career comes at the age of eighteen rather than at the age of 30, because sometimes at the age of 30 might all already be too late. So, uh, but you learn every day, whether or not it's life, football, um, interviews, choosing your friends, choosing your enemies. It's just, uh, you know, life lessons. So you learn every day and uh, and hopefully, hopefully you do learn from your mistakes. And I think, I believe I have done that. That's great to hear, mate. I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that because obviously the the feeling around that it was particularly that article that hurt the fans more than anything, like the the request or anything. Does you you wouldn't have been the first to hand the transfer request in, but to hear that come from you is really pleasing to hear. And obviously, I think as fans, we we are quite cynical towards the mainstream press these days, so maybe we wouldn't have believed what we read the way maybe we did back in two thousand and four. So. 
it's really pleasing to hear that, and it's it's good to see that you've you've clearly like you, you're really showing that you have learned a lot from your mistakes. You you seem to be living your best life. Like moving forward now, obviously with 16 years on from when you left the club, I think the attitudes, particularly with the age of social media, I think the fans nowadays are a lot more cynical towards the press, and maybe if they were the way they were now, we might not have believed everything we read back then. Back then, when you when that article was published, so it, it's interesting to hear you give your side of the story, and I, I, I'd like to believe like that. It was the newspapers that did it, and I'm, I'm well inclined to believe it, given the nature of the English press. So, it, it's it's brilliant to hear that you have still you sort of move forward from what happened in 2004, and the, that you certainly have started rebuilding bridges with the fans. I've, I've heard you were seen at a couple of Everton games, weren't you? Yeah, you know what? I've been to Liverpool already. Uh, well, already only twice since um, since I left. Um, Reason being is like you know all the uh, all the all, well all the uh, players have, have have moved on somewhere. So if I if I'm in the neighborhood of uh, of Manchester, just uh, maybe to visit uh, visit somebody there. Well, I will definitely do the trip and and, and go to uh, to Everton. And if there is a game, I definitely go and visit uh, and see one. So the latest one, it's already well a year and a half ago against Huddersfield. Um, and, and we won that game uh, as well. So uh, I believe, uh, actually, I believe that was the, the game where David Answorth was uh, was a gaffer. If if I don't, um, it may well have it, been. Yeah, it, it, it may well. Have, yeah, I, I I think it was uh, one of his first games, and, and we won to to two one or two two nil that two, game. Two so, nil. Yeah, I think I remember. Yeah. That so it, yes. So I, I I like to come back, you know, and and, and I I like to see the uh, the Goodison Park again from a dis- different perspective than 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 from the pitch as well. Uh, this time I was sitting right behind the goal, so it was a uh, was was an experience that I've never encountered before because I've never sat behind the goal, even uh, even when I was injured, you know, it was always somewhere on the side uh, uh, of the um, you know on the on, on on the side, but back of the goal have never been so um, people were still very nice you know uh, i um, even without a parking ticket um, they have uh, let me uh, drive pretty much all the way to the stadium uh, and i could have parked right right next to goodison park which was which was amazing to see i mean i don't i don't know who the people were who were letting me through but it was like oh yeah uh, yeah of course just you know come in and park no problem so it was it was amazing to see that that you know, even after all those years, uh, you, uh, you you're still being uh, being recognized and and part of the uh, Toffees community. So it, it was uh, it was really really nice. It was uh, it was amazing to to know that there are still big uh, big blue hearts over there that that care for the stupid little Canadian who comes back and watch one game. Well, to be fair, <laughs> you've you've left a, a much better legacy than you're giving yourself credit for. To be fair, that that 2002 three season still remembered really really well by us fans and of course by me it was my first season watching Everton so a lot of good memories so we're going to finish off now with a few quick questions Thomas first of all who's the best player you played with at Everton this might be a bit of a silly question um, well there would have to be two um, it's definitely Gaza on the top of my list it's uh I, uh, I mean, the, the skill level of this man at that time, it was just, well, it's incredible. I mean, when when he was up for it, it was uh, out of this world. And then, well, it had to be Wayne um, just because of this, of the age and, and what he was showing at the, at the training. It would be, uh, it would be two of the uh, most uh, brilliant footballers probably I've encountered. Point. That's- I think that's probably they're probably the names that would probably show up when most people would ask who was the best to play alongside you as well. So I don't think we can argue with that. So uh, do you still watch Everton or keep an eye on how we're doing, even if you don't always get to the games? Well, you know, all all the teams I I played for, I mean, I always keep an eye out. Um, but especially with with Everton, we uh, I I do uh, TV commentary here in Belgium, and uh, most of the time it's uh, if there is an Everton game, uh, and and especially when there is a derby being televised live against Liverpool. 
So Everton, Liverpool, Liverpool, Everton. That's where I'm the studio studio guest here uh, in Belgium, and uh, that's when I definitely watch uh, the Everton game. Yeah, you know, it's not it's not really the best time to be watching at the moment. We haven't done too well in the last few years, so uh, surely, hopefully, they'll get you on for a few other games and some games we actually win. Yeah, well, you, you know, you uh, you had uh, you had Lukaku in, in your ranks and 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 Miralas and two Belgians that play for uh, for Everton as well. So uh, it's uh, it's been televised here quite a few times just because of the Belgian contingents. You know, same with uh, City and, and and Chelsea at the time when when Hazard and uh, and uh, Courtois and and De Bruyne were playing. So we've seen we've seen quite a few quite a few games and especially when the boys when the uh, Belgian boys. Um, play against each other so that meant Everton City Everton Chelsea you know the games are always on so uh, I'm definitely following it um, uh, quite a lot and what's your best memory of playing for Everton well it's probably the best the same memory like you have um, your, your first game it's 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 just because it was such a crazy game that we, uh, we you know like I told you we should have won probably 10-1 that game and, and we barely won 2-1 but those two goals in the last ten minutes of the game, uh, coming from my, my 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 foot in my head, you know, it just got stuck. It's just because the uh, well, the first one is I, I rarely score with the head, um, and here I jumped higher than anybody else. <laughs> so uh, and I scored, and the second goal was uh, was one of those where you don't really make them every uh, every week. You make them once a season at best. So. Um, yeah, it was uh, definitely one of those memories I will, uh, I will, uh, I will keep uh, cherishing. Definitely. And finally, before we finish, do you have a final message that you want to say to the Everton fans watching about your time at the club? Well, listen, I, I really I had fantastic time there at Everton, and and I will do my part of coming uh, more often to the games. Maybe reconnect with the fans. Uh, Speak with uh, the um, Everton press. Maybe, maybe give uh, one of uh, one another kickoff. Um, I still have a connection with Darren Griffith, who is uh, at the media center in the, at Everton, and he actually did ask me a few months ago to come to Everton and and, and do something um, there. Um, again, I'm I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure um, how I'm being received at Everton. So this is probably something that does keep me. A little bit back. I hope the 15 years uh, has healed some wounds. But uh, uh, what I do want to say is, I really had fantastic time, and 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 I would be, I would love to come back and and just uh, see the uh, see the Goodison Park again from the uh, from the center circle again, kind of like giving a kickoff because it does uh, it just gives me goosebumps every single time I think about it. Atmosphere is great. Stadium is not the youngest anymore, but it still uh, has an atmosphere of a, of, of a really football temple. So um, hopefully, uh, you know, this season is going to be uh, finished. You never know when, but uh, hopefully, uh, you know, with a new coach uh, that you guys have for the last few months and Doug, Duncan Ferguson helping him out on the sidelines, there is a still connection for me. You know, I still uh, I spoke to uh, Lukaku uh, a few months ago, and he still told me that uh, you know all the Jimmies, the ma- the, the masseur and and the kitman, they are still working there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is, which is great to know. I, I don't know whether or not Sue is uh, still working at the reception. Um, that'd be fantastic to see her again, see the new training ground of the uh, of Everton Inchal, because this yeah. is something I just missed. Uh, so I have not been there. You know. Uh, just make it make a trip, make it make it a day out or, or even a weekend at Everton. So uh, I've been I've I've been I've been to uh, to Liverpool I think three years ago now when there was a book um, uh, that came out um, so uh, about Liverpool and Everton together. Um, so um, you know I've been there as well, but I've never made it to the game. It's just different timing. So uh, I just hope I can watch more games live because. Uh, Watching uh, watching live games is way better than watching it on telly, especially coming here from Belgium. is is, is better to just fly one time to Liverpool. It's so easy. It's only an hour away. So I wish I can go there one time and meet you all again. That'd be great to see you again. So there you have it, guys. 101 appearances, 26 goals, lots of ups and downs, lessons learned, and most of all, still a lot of affection for the Blues. That's Thomas Radzinski, ladies and gentlemen. 
a brilliant chat and hopefully not the last time we see you here on the Toffee Blues, Thomas. Well, I hope so too. Well, uh, let's keep uh, keep the good work, guys. And uh, and really, Everton is is doing great the last uh, 15 years, 20 years since I've been there. So uh, hopefully they play more Champions League and more European football. it would be fantastic for the Toffees. That's definitely what we're hoping for as well, Thomas. And it'd be great to see you back at Goodison again to maybe see a few of those games if we get there. You definitely will. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. Uh, so this is the end of our show. As always, to our viewers, get involved. Let us know your memories of Thomas as an Everton player, your favourite goals, perhaps. Of course, if you enjoyed the show, give the video a like. And if you want to be more, see more great content, subscribe to the Toffee Blues YouTube channel and also give us a follow on Twitter at Everton Newsfeed. All that's left for, for me to say, really, is thank you so much to Thomas Radzinski for joining me on the show today. You're welcome, James. Good luck. It's been an absolute pleasure. And of course, thank you guys for watching on the Toffee Blues.